And as soon as I saw it, I was like, Hi, I'm George the Antique Nomad. Come with me as I wander the country in search of valuable vintage, amazing antiques, and cool collectibles. We'll buy, sell, and trade at antique malls, shops, and shows, estate sales, flea markets, thrift stores, anywhere people go to find really interesting things that just aren't made anymore. So come on, let's go. Hello everybody, welcome to the monthly eBay haul video. This is my bonus video. Thank you very much to my level two members who get to see it first for your extra sponsorship that helps make it possible. And if you are not a level two member, you can click that join button or take a look at the link in the description and you'll see a video all about that. But I am really glad to have the opportunity to show you some things that are just going up on eBay right now as this video premieres. And if you are seeing this video after the premiere, some of the items will probably still be available depending on whether people did the buy it now or if they're waiting to see what happens. So uh, one of the fun things about this is you get to see, as I do, what the market is on eBay for particular things that are a little more unusual or just a broad range of merchandise. I like to try to pick some better things and some things from a lot of different categories. So we're going to do some show and tell and talk about what makes them cool. And let's get started right now because I've got 20 items that I've been say setting aside all month for this and I am excited to show them to you. We're going to start off with some jewelry because I know that a lot of my viewers really appreciate jewelry and I do too. And this is a very pretty set of beads. And if you notice that they are enameled, they are enameled with little roses. They're about a half an inch around. Looking at this type of clasp with this particular configuration, these clasps were used in the late 70s. So this piece is going to date about around 1980. It is 24 inches. I talk a lot about wedding cake beads because I think they're so neat. See those sort of swirly gold bits? Well, that's the wedding cake. It's like putting frosting on a cake. Whereas this is a little more controlled. These are nicely enameled in little rose patterns. So you're actually getting a floral pattern on these beads that are for sale. And I think that that just gives them a little bit of extra charm and refinement. The Italians came to make beads because of trade beads. The Europeans wanted things they could trade in Africa and in North America. And just as beautiful art glass and things made of it were rather novel and revolutionary to early Europeans, they also were so to Africans and Native Americans who didn't have this kind of technology. So they thought the beads were beautiful and worth a lot to them. And they were willing to trade rather nice raw materials and things that the English and Italians and Europeans wanted. And they got all the credit for having invented these, but actually it was the Syrians who first came up with doing the enameling on glass. But after the siege of Damascus in 1400, a lot of those glass blowers fled. And where did they go? They went to Murano in Italy. And that's why Murano ended up becoming the bead capital for many, many centuries and they still make beautiful beads. So these are going online right now at the Antique Nomad on eBay. So you can take a look at that and we'll see how they do. The next piece I want to show actually goes back considerably earlier than that. And we know that because it has a nice little card with it. Now, I do not always believe what I'm told when I read little cards about where things came from. But I believe this card because I know the family who had this and this is in their family just three generations back. And so there actually was a gentleman in the family alive until very recently who knew this woman. And this woman who had the William Greer Howe as a child was a woman by the name of Dial, and we'll see some of her things soon. But when she had her baby boy, and I want to emphasize it was a baby boy, not a girl, this was the cotton that they made into a dress. And yes, little boys were put in dresses until the age of three during the Victorian era. Little boys did not wear trousers at all. And then they had what they called a skeleton suit. 
And that was what they wore until they were about six years old, so it got them used to the idea of pants. But when children were very little, boys and girls wore essentially the same thing, which were little dresses. And so this one is very typical of 1830s construction. It's got the puffed caps on the sleeves. It's a nice cotton print. This would have been fairly lightweight, so this would have been appropriate for summer. It's in generally good condition. It does have one hole here, right where my finger is. You can see right there where there's some sort of a hole from age. But all in all, this is in pretty good shape especially for being from the 1830s. This is one of the oldest textiles I've had in a very long time. And we will show you that she was so fond of the fabric that she kept some of it to make his first vest. And here's the little vest that I'm selling them together as a package. Uh, the vest has the stain you see here, but it has all its original buttons. And again, this would have been a vest to go under a little first suit so it's plain on the back. It's not finished off in any way. It's just got the muslin. And it is just cute as can be. It's got little pockets. The pockets are fake. Again, it's just to get the idea across to the kid that, oh, this is how clothes are going to be made. And when you grow up, you'll be wearing things like this. So I just think this is a really great little set. And I believe that this one, I think I have just a start at now price and we're gonna see where it goes. My guess is that these two pieces together are probably worth somewhere in the 75 to $100 range. But if we find somebody who has a particular interest in Victorian clothing, it's so hard to find that it could shoot way up from there. So we'll see what happens. So the next item I have to show you is a box. Now you could use this as a dresser box, a trinket box really anything you wanted. It was not squarish, so it was not really made for cigarettes originally. But this was by a company called Rosenthal, or Rosenthal as they would say in Germany, and it's very well marked on the back. This piece is going to date to about the 1960s, and the 1960s were an era of a fairly triumphant comeback for Rosenthal. The Rosenthals were a family who did very well, built the largest and most successful porcelain firm in modern day Germany, and then the Nazis took over because the Rosenthals had Jewish background. And so the Rosenthals fled Germany. Goebbels actually kept the name in use because he knew the foreign accounts wanted it, even though it was a Jewish surname. And after the war, the son of the founder, Philip Rosenthal, came back to Germany from exile. And in 1950, he took over control of the firm and he modernized it. He brought in a lot of modern equipment, he rebuilt the factories, and he brought in a whole lot of really important designers. So you will see this same box decorated with really crazy designs by everybody from Salvador Dali to Bjorn Vindblad. The line was so successful that they did all sorts of other designs as well. And this peacock is going to be something from about the 1960s. I think it's a very pretty piece. There's a lot of people who really enjoy peacocks and like to look at them. And I think that somebody will fancy this and it's in very nice condition. I believe the value on this piece is probably around 30 to $40 and we shall see. And while we're on the porcelain and pottery, I wanted to show this pretty piece next because this one is Francoma. And this is an unusual sky blue glaze. This glaze came out around 1942. And part of the reason it's so scarce is that the materials needed for the glazes were in short supply because of the war. And as a result, Francoma made the least number of pieces during this era of all the eras. And so this color is a lot scarcer than a lot of other colors. The shell vase was a continuation of their deco lines. John Frank was the fellow who started the designs in 1933 and his original lines all were very art deco influenced because those were the trends at the time. By the 50s, he really shifts to a more Western inspired type of design. And so we don't really see a lot of this deco design after the 1940s from Francoma. It's nice because it's joined at the top here so it actually can be picked up and carried and used as a flower arranger because you have a break so the flowers can stay and open up against each other. So it was an intelligent design and we also know that it's early because look at the color of clay on the bottom. It's more to the tan than the pink. 
you will see that the Francoma name is not completely legible because one problem this pattern had is that it had a big wide foot and so the glaze would sometimes bubble over and stick to the kiln as you see here there's little remnants of the glaze so they had to peel this off basically use a file and scrape it off of the kiln when it was done and that meant that part of the Francoma name was obscured. And that's why these little shell vases are a good thing to look for if you're a reseller because a lot of times they are not marked even though they are Francoma. And so I got this one for a very inexpensive price because the person did not know what it was. Ada was the town they originally made Francoma in. And the Ada clay and the earlier glazes can be really tricky to find. So I suspect this is worth between $30 and $40. And we shall see what the people out in eBay land think of that. Now just for something completely different, I decided this time that we're going to auction off some perfume. And this is Leonard Parfum from Paris. Now, these are a little different. Leonard is a company that if you're into vintage fashion, you may know or you definitely should learn because the house of Leonard mainly did women's dresses. Leonard was known for doing leopard print for Christian Dior amongst other people. So they are a big deal name in French fashion. They had done really pretty much only things for women until 1980 and somebody convinced them that since they were now doing perfume for women that they ought to introduce men's cologne because women typically buy fragrances for men so they could sell them in the boutique next to the women's. So they came up with this little box set as one of the lines. This is Ballet and then this is a little bit of Eau de Cologne. The pattern on the front of the Eau de Cologne is based on a big metal torso that was used to keep the soldiers from being stabbed in the Roman era. And the reason they put that on there is they were concerned that men would think, well, Leonard is a women's line, it's not masculine enough. So that is where the Leonard logo comes from. Let me see if I can get that to where you can see it a little better. Now you can see that a little bit of this has been used. But this particular fragrance in the bottle here is something that wasn't in production long and is rather hard to come by. So as a result, even though it's not completely unused, I did decide to go ahead and run this anyway. I suspect it could sell in this condition in the $30 to $40 range. If it was full, this particular cologne and fragrance, they smell great by the way, if you like such things. And this is out of production, I understand. Uh, I've seen comparables on these as much as $100. So uh, we will see what the market thinks of having a slightly less than new one. And since we're still in the realm of the dresser, I wanted to show this next. This is a compact, and people have really been enjoying compacts, I've noticed. So I wanted to put another one out there, especially because this one is so much fun. This is what they referred to in the 1960s as confetti. It's little pieces of lame and glitter sandwiched in acrylic. And that's where you get all of this really neat color. Let me get it up a little closer. I think you'll be able to get the idea. Now this one is American made. It does not actually tell us who made it, which is unusual, but it does have its original puff. The mirror is in good condition and the interior seems to be not scratched or blemished at all. So it's in nice shape. It does have some normal wear on the bottom from use, but all in all, it's a cute little piece and people are loving compacts. I think I have this starting at $19.99. I think there's a buy it now of $29.99 on it. Uh, you could get earrings and bracelets and cuffs to match that back in the day. It was part of what they called party pastels. Pastels are coming back into fashion now and they were big in the early 60s and that's when you see a lot of the confetti. Now the next item I have, some of you folks may have seen this when I was with the folks in Indiana and we all went shopping. That's where I bought this guy. He is Kutani. Kutani is an area in Japan. Kutani means nine valleys. Nemuri Keto, which is sleeping cat. This is a very famous old style in Kutani wear. Now this particular one appears to be early nationalist Japanese. I'm gonna hold it a little closer. Kutani was really known for very fine work and that's where you see these brush hair strokes in the gold. And this one has the correct red and gold on ivory. Now a lot of these have been reproduced in China. They tend to be a lot more garish in color. So this one appears to be legitimate. This originally had a felt bottom which has been removed 
So there's really not a lot of marks or anything you can see on the bottom for identity. You just really have to know the pieces. It's got a little bit of crackling and crazing, not heavy, but a little bit. And it's just a cute piece. Now, I had one of these that was 19th century at one point and sold it with its two little kittens for about $750 because the 19th century ones are definitely prized and older and people like the things from the pre-nationalist era of Japan. The nationalist era ones are more of a decorative item. He should sell somewhere in the $100 range. I'm starting him at 50, so we shall see. Next, I'd like to show this very, very vibrant bowl. This, I think, is a real beauty. Look at the color, the depth of the opalescence. You can see the fire in the opal, even with me holding it this way. If you were behind it, it's really, really fiery. It is just a lovely piece. This is Fostoria's heirloom pattern. Fostoria was known for all sorts of pretty etched patterns and very formal and fussy patterns they tended to try to make for the upper middle part of the market. In 1959, they decided they needed something a little more modernist, and this is where heirloom came from. It was made all through the 1960s. It came in this color as well as pinks. There's some in ruby, there's some in a bittersweet orange, but they're mostly pastels, yellows, whites, pinks, greens, blues. I just really fancy this kind of thing. I, I think it's a great look. It's very modernist. It's a fun color. It's opalescent glass, so it's more interesting than just a regular plain solid color glass to my eye. The vases that they made were swung. Now this is not swung. This is done in a mold. Some of the bowls were done in a mold and then pulled to be stretched and elongated, but this one is a molded piece. But then they would fire polish the bottom so you see no mold marks. So very good quality. I just really like this. I'm starting it at $29.99. I believe it should sell for around $50. This one's a little tricky. I'll have to show you in pieces, but I have another set of sterling, but this time it's a beverage set. And a beverage set has a lovely coffee pot, a nice teapot, Here's the creamer. Here's the sugar with lid. These are a pattern called Baroque, and this is by Alt Heidelberg in Germany. And it is truly sterling. There, were, there was a long period of time where people avoided German silver because the Germans typically made coin silver. Uh, but this one is very clearly marked sterling. It also has some other marks on it. If you notice the driver's license and information scratched on the bottom, well, that means anytime you see that on the bottom of a piece of silver, that means that the people panicked during the 1981 attempt by the Hunt brothers to corner the silver market. And when silver briefly shot over $50 an ounce, everybody was warned, you better put your driver's license and information, etch it into the bottom of all your silver pieces, because then if they're stolen, they can be returned to you as if somebody wouldn't just scrape that right off. Uh, it was not a great idea, but fortunately it was mainly done on the bottoms of things, so it doesn't really devalue them. But you will see that on a lot of pieces that were held at that time. There's some other interesting things about this compared to some of the better known silver from America, like Gorham and some of those makers. One thing I thought was interesting is they used Bakelite as the spacers. So this is going to be something from about 1950 because we're still using Bakelite, but we're using that instead of ebony or ivory or earlier things, and it's not new enough to be just some regular kind of vinyl plastic. The other thing that I find interesting, it says uh, Alt Heidelberg, it's Mark Sterling. I believe that some of the pieces say Handarbeit, which means hand-worked or handmade. And what I think is great about this is that it's really got a lot of look. It's very fancy. It's got the Rococo off-center uh, designs in it, even though they refer to it as Baroque. I just think it's a nice pattern if you like traditional. And the thing is, is that it's going to be hundreds of dollars less than it would be if it was Gorham or Toll or one of the American companies that is better known. Um, so this set is, it's 58 ounces of silver in total. It had a tray with it. The tray was marked alpaca. 
Alt Heidelberg was one of several companies who saved money and made their stuff less expensive by making the tray out of a lesser material than the rest of the pieces because the tray was the heaviest piece. I do not have the tray with this set. Uh, if you go to look for a sterling tray, well, they never made a sterling tray for this set. It was always made of this other material. I'm starting it at 975. The silver value should be somewhere in the 1100 range, so I expect it will settle somewhere around there. We will find out. I had a professor in college who said that we all should get a nice silver tea service to put in our offices when we were important because it was very nice to serve a client from a sterling tea service and they would be very impressed. And I remember that us college students who were eating off of paper plates at that time were not particularly impressed with that advice. Nowadays it seems like a better idea. This fellow is number 10 of our 20 items and this is what we refer to as santos. Santos represent the Holy Trinity or saints or various other important uh, people in Catholicism. They were very popular to make in Spanish colonies and places with a lot of Hispanic population. In our country, you see these typically more in Texas and New Mexico, for example. This particular one appears to be 19th century. They were made even earlier than that. He is polychrome, which means a, he's a detallado, I believe is how it's pronounced, meaning detailed, as opposed to the other varieties where they would add a lot of things to a piece that were not part of the carved piece. So uh, he is a detallado. His little hand here will come off, but it's a good chance for me to show you how these were made. And he's got a little wormwood, so you can tell the age. Uh, this would have actually been pegged in. So they carved the main body and then they did some extra pieces that they carved in. One of which has fallen off years ago and become lost. It's very difficult to find these intact and fully all there uh, because of the way they were made, because they were used as altar pieces. Uh, they sat in one place for many, 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 many years in many cases. And then eventually there would be some sort of a change in the church, a re-sanctification, and these things would go away. And that's how they ended up in the market. Some of these are pegged on the bottom like this one is and peg joinery is definitely a way you can see something that's handmade and older. These pegs hold this bottom piece, although not very well, uh, to the stand and the rest of the pieces. You see evidence of wormwood. So this does have nice age. It is 19th century. You can see some of the pegging here. In fact, because this is loose, I'm gonna just take it off and show you how it's made underneath and how the pegs are indeed made to fit. And so that is part of the construction. So believe it or not, as Santos go, this guy is not considered to be in terrible condition. He's actually considered to be fairly complete and original. And I'm going to start him around $145 and see where the market goes. I think he could be worth double that to the right person. Well, this kind of goes with what I'm wearing. So I think I'll just put it on because this is our next item. It's a wood and Bakelite carved necklace. And obviously you can see the Bakelite on there. And then it has a celluloid chain. Now the chain is a bit on the short side. It does fit around my neck. It's 15 inches, but it's such a big open chain and it's made with another chain holding so that the little ball is your catch. Let's get that in there so you can see. So since it's such a basic, chain it would be very easy to put an extender on that and I think someone will probably have to because you might want it to lay a little lower uh, but I think it's a very pretty piece uh, the carving is just really nicely done carved bakelite is popular and then you have carved wood on top of it this was done in the second world war because they could not get rhinestones from Austria and a lot were coming from there before the war. So they figured out, well, we've got to make things out of other materials and wood and Bakelite made a nice contrast. Bakelite was a great thing to carve because you could uh, carve very deeply into it. It's very hard and so it could take that. So cute piece. I just thought it was really a lot of fun. I found this at the Springfield Antique Show in Ohio and put it aside so that you folks could have first access to it. And I believe I'm starting that at $49.99.
Bakelite was super expensive. There was a time that was a $125 or $150 necklace. I don't know that it's going to go for anything near that these days. Bakelite is softer in the market than it was. And that's actually a good thing because it's letting a lot of new people get interested. And it's also shutting down a lot of reproduction that was being done. Not so much of carved pieces because that was a lot of work, but people were assembling things out of old Bakelite poker chips and calling them necklaces and all sorts of things that were um, fantasy items. And the fact that the prices fell as a result means those people aren't doing that anymore, which actually helps for the purity of the antique pieces. So earlier I showed the 1836 boys dress and vest and they came as a result of the wedding of Mrs. Dial. We have a few more little scraps of paper that the family left in with these, but it's helpful because again, I know this family and they were able to verify these things. So we do have provenance. Mrs. Dial who married into the Ho family wore this lace cap and this lace veil on her wedding day in 1833. I'm not going to try to put on the cap. I think they're just amazing. Lace was very difficult to make and very time consuming and less, lace makers actually had a very hard career. It was such fine work there was not adequate lighting because we didn't have overhead electric lighting then and they would work sometimes long into the night and it was such incredible work. Look at all the detail in this and all of this was done by hand and so lace makers typically only could work until they were in their late 20s or early 30s because by then they usually were blind and sometimes arthritic. It was a very difficult thing to do. And it was done for the very wealthy or for very, very special occasions like a wedding. You can see some of the patterning in here. You can identify lace by its patterns to a certain extent or at least you can identify where the family was from if it was a family made piece. There's lots of Chantilly lace that was not made in Chantilly. It was a style. There's lots of Battenberg lace that was not made in Battenberg. It's just where that pattern or style came from. So um, this particular one just has a lot of little cartouches around it. I just think it's very sweet. The, the, the cap is in amazing shape and it was typical you would wear a cap and a veil to your wedding. The veil has had a little bit of a hard life. These things have been stored for decades. It got spotted at some point and it does have some holes. It has a hole here where my thumb is. It has a hole down by the bottom and it has a hole dead center in the middle. So it's by no means perfect but I imagine that by the time I'm 190 years old. I might be a little less than perfect myself. So I think someone will just really love and appreciate this work. Perhaps they will use it as the something old in a June wedding. It's entirely possible. We do sell some of these things and it's not something that somebody would wear necessarily. They might wear it in a pocket or have it with them as they're something old. So I think they're very sweet. It's great that we know where they came from. These folks were married in a little settlement outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in 1833. I have to say I don't know exactly what to expect from the market on this one. I'm starting them at $49.99. My sense is that the market could be double that or more. I don't see a lot of people even trying to sell textiles this old. And I know a lot of people would say, oh, those should be in a museum. They should be museum pieces. Well, here's the problem. Museums are full of donations from families in local areas who donated similar types of items. And so don't just send things blindly to the local museum or the place your family was from and say, here, have this because you're thinking it's going to be shown in the museum because there's a chance it could be sent off and auctioned as a fundraiser for that museum. They often need money more than they need more stuff. And so since these pieces are well known, I think it's appropriate to put them out on the open market and see if a collector or somebody who might use them and prize them in some other way would like to have access to them rather than having them be in the archives of the museum in the back where no one ever sees them. 
This is another thing I picked up in Indiana, and it is a still bank. That's what it's called when it's not mechanical, meaning you don't push a lever to make a coin fly into something. You just put coins in it. And where do you put the coins in this one? You put them right in his shoulder, right there is the slot. This is Mutton Jeff. Mutton Jeff is a cartoon that I remember from when I was a kid. There was a nostalgia kick in the 70s and it was published in a bunch of papers again. It was kind of its last hurrah. It quit publishing as a regular strip in 1983. But that was after 78 years. In fact, Mutt and Jeff pretty much get credit for inventing the Sunday Funnies. Because the fellow who was the illustrator and creator of these characters, a fellow named Bud Fisher, well, Bud Fisher tried and tried and tried to get the San Francisco Chronicle to let him have a strip every day so that he could express what the character was doing in more than one panel. And at first that was rejected. Then a paper in Chicago tried it with another strip and it failed, but somehow Bud Fisher convinced the head of the San Francisco Chronicle to give it a chance anyway. Bud Fisher was pretty smart. Not only did he see that comic strips would work, he got them to publish on Sunday, which was considered just scandalous at the time, but turned out to be very popular with people who were sitting home reading the Sunday paper. And Mutt and Jeff were a real comic pair. Mutt and Jeff met because they were both interested in horse racing. That's how the story goes. And the point of the thing, besides their exploits and them getting into all sorts of scrapes and trouble, was also to show the contrast between two people who have something in common and are friends but are very different in other ways. One is tall and skinny, one is short and not. The tall guy is a horse enthusiast who's a terrible gambler. The short guy, who is Jeff, he met at an insane asylum, but he got Jeff out and started running around with him because Jeff was a much better horse gambler than he was. So that is the story behind Mutt and Jeff. It's cast iron. These character still banks were a very new idea around 1920. There really hadn't been comic characters. So this is some of the very first merchandising of comic characters that you see, this particular bank here. And that's why it sells for as much as $100. I'm planning on starting it at half of that, and we'll see what happens from there. This pretty vase here is cloisonné, but it's a different type. It's called wireless cloisonné. Take a look how, unlike the usual cloisonné where you see little wires in the enamel holding everything in, this has a transparent and then foil-backed field and then the dogwoods are on top of it. So what they do is they set all the dogwoods in just like they would with the wires, and then they remove wires before firing, and then the background has this wireless nature to it. So you get all of that design of cloisonné, but you actually don't have all the literal wires. So this was considered rather an advancement. And there are a lot of people who collect this specifically as opposed to the cloisonné where you see the wires more. This one is by a company called Sato, S-A-T-O, from Japan. There is a mark there. It's a nice little piece. The color is good. I suspect it's worth between about $50 and $75, and we'll see if the world of eBay agrees with me, but I think this one's really nice. Well, next up is something that I shared on a video when I got it. I think it's very pretty. I have had people look at it at shows, and I don't think that having it out at shows is doing it any favors. I want to keep it in good condition, so I've decided to put it online and sell it that way instead. This is a French microbeaded purse. Now, we see a lot of these little microbeaded purses from Japan in the 1950s. These French purses are what they were copying because these were very popular in the early 50s for a few years. Big fashion companies like the House of Robert made them. This particular one is done by a smaller Paris house. It has the label inside, Sagil of Paris, and they now sell primarily, they're still there at 242 Rue de Rivoli, but they now sell primarily watches and fashion accessories, and they don't do the purses anymore. This one clicks well and stays shut, which is important, but what I really like about it is they sewed the microbeads over this very finely detailed cruel embroidery, 
with the roses and floral spray. And so it really has great, beautiful, deep color when you look at it up close. And that just makes it a lot more special to me. I just thought this one was a lot more interesting than a lot of these that we see. This was the era when handbags started to really become a point of expression. Designer handbags started to be something that people sought out and a purse became more of a statement as opposed to just something that you buy because it matches your shoes. So this is a great era of purse to collect. A lot of people like to hang these on their wall as decoration. I have a friend who hangs them up and she just takes one down and walks out the door with it when she decides what she wants for the day. The condition is good on this. You can see that from normal use, there's a little bit of looseness where the beads are, but nothing is loose like falling off. Just, I mean, just open a little bit from wear. Uh, other than that, there's really no problems with it. I think it's very sweet and I'm not sure what it'll go for. We'll find out together. I carry a lot of Native American basketry and I keep coming up with interesting collections of it. And this is from a friend of mine who had a really neat house up in Quilcene, Washington. And she and her husband had it as a little place to go for the weekend for a long time. And they've decided to just settle back in Seattle now. And so she had decorated with a lot of this sort of thing and gave me some of it to sell. And this particular piece she got, I thought was very neat. It's just a little round or a trivet, just a flat piece, but it says Bethel. And Bethel is a very important place to the Yupik people of Alaska. The Yupik are the natives who do probably the greatest amount of the basketry made with beach grass. And this little piece would have been a souvenir from Bethel. And looking at the colors and the way it's made and the fact that the dye has actually run a little means it's a natural dye, which is good. And because of that, this little piece, I believe is going to date to sometime in the 1950s. And I just thought the colors were great, the condition is good. I suspect that it's something around a $40 or $50 piece. The Yupik people made some really nice things and some of the patterning is very reminiscent of Papago or Apache or other Southwest when you get into some of the geometry. Uh, but this one is very clearly Alaskan because it says Bethel. Now Bethel was not a very big town. It still only has 6,000 people. You have to fly there. There are 16 miles of roads. There's one paved road in the town and they have ironically the highest number of taxi drivers per capita taking people back and forth on that road because it's the only way to get around. And so Bethel is not a place you see a lot of things from because not a lot of people have been there. I've never been anywhere near it and I've been to Alaska. So I think it's just cool and I hope that someone out there thinks it's cool too. Well, there's nothing like being exclusive, darling. And so you might need, if you're really exclusive, this members only sign, which is black painted on brass. And you can see by the design of the letters, typefaces are a really good way to date things. These letters are an art moderne style. So this is something that's likely to date from sometime in the 1950s. I cannot tell you where it came from. I got it in Washington State. It is possible because of the area I got it from that it came from one of the military officers clubs, but usually I would think they would say officers only as I remember from growing up around them. So I think this might have been some other private club. It's very official. It's a little disarming. I guess that's the point of it. But if you or someone you know is a members only kind of person, or you collect members only or sell members only stuff from the 1980s, well, maybe this is something that's for you. I believe I'm starting this off at a whopping 1999 and we're gonna see what people think of it. Uh, old signs are very popular right now and this one's got some real heft because of its age. So it's substantial. I debated whether to put this next item on eBay and, well, I shouldn't say that. I didn't have any question about putting it on eBay. I wanted to put it on eBay while we still could. I questioned whether I should put it in this video, but I thought it was important to let everybody know what's happening. So this is a good way to do it. This is a Tijuana Bible. And yes, it has Wimpy from Popeye on it, which is very cute and sweet, right? Well, the reason they call them a Tijuana Bible, and this one's an eight pager, 
It is, in fact, eight pages long. I cannot show you page eight. I really can only show you page one, where Popeye comes in to tell Wimpy some news. Page two is where they meet two lovely young women under a lamppost. And pages three through eight, well, they're not anything I can show you in this video. And eBay has chosen in the near future to stop showing these things as well. They are planning on discontinuing their adults only category. That is where you will find this piece because it is indeed, well, a Tijuana Bible. And these were the little X-rated things they would take cartoon characters or famous celebrities and parody them and they are graphically frontally sexually explicit these were called tijuana bibles because they were absolutely illegal in the united states of america and if they had been printed here and someone could trace it back to the printer all of these celebrities could have sued for defamation and so could have king feature syndicate who had the syndication on not just Popeye, but Mutt and Jeff, actually, that was the first syndicated cartoon. So, these are naughty. And eBay has decided that naughty is not going to be something that they're going to allow us to sell through them anymore. That takes effect, I believe, at the end of June. And so, I thought that since it's a specialized area, and collectors for these sorts of things are scattered over a very wide area, eBay is the place to try to find them while there's still a chance. So I'm putting it out at $19.99. I suspect it will sell for about 25 to 30 and we'll sell it while we can. They have said because of the managed payments that they've changed their policies and adults only going away, they've sort of tucked into that and people are just finding out about it. So I wanted to let you know because if you are a reseller and you have vintage naughty stuff that does sell, well, you may not be able to sell it on eBay anymore. I have to say that I thought the way they had it set up where you have to verify your age by putting in a credit card of your own and all that sort of stuff was really a very fail-safe way to make sure that the wrong people weren't seeing this, but they've decided it's just not worth the bother. At some point, I suspect that someone enterprising will start an alternative website to sell the kinds of things that we can't sell on eBay anymore because they're starting to be a very long list. But let's come back to something very G-rated and very pretty, like this stork embroidery. And I'll step back so you can see the whole thing. I thought this was very pretty. This was also part of the same family's collection that had the vintage textiles, the old clothes from the 1830s. Well, this is not 1830s, and we can tell why. Because on the back, it advertises that it is the New Ideal Embroidery Pattern Company that sells these things and that you can make your own. That was a really big deal around 1910 because up until about 1900, embroidery all had to be done by hand by a professional in a shop and it was very expensive to have done. Just like lace, it was one of those things that became too expensive to really produce and so people started being able to produce it at home with their own kits. And suddenly it was available to the middle class and embroidery became a really big deal. That's why we see so many embroidered linens from the early 1900s because that wasn't something people spent their time doing. We think, oh, they did it in their free time for fun. Well, people didn't have a lot of free time for fun until around then. So yes, they did do extra embellishment for fun, but that was a pretty new idea. It wasn't like that had been going on for decades. It was like, oh, hey, we've got a moment. Let's sew a pretty picture. And I think this one is really nice. It's velvet in the background. It's, uh, they use some sort of a chenille for the bird and for the palmate plant there. And I just think it's got great color because it's been in a trunk for about 70 years and hasn't seen the light of day. It was never made into anything. It's even got sort of the original scrappy edges left on it still, which I'm going to leave. I'm going to let the new purchaser decide how they want to handle that. So it's pretty. I did not see anything like this online. I don't know exactly what it'll sell for. My hunch is that it will probably go somewhere between $30 and $50, but we'll see.
Well, gosh, that already brings us to number 20 on the list. And I'm excited about this piece. And you're going to look at it and think, why? So let's show you. Look, it's a plate. A plate. Yay, one more plate. Don't have enough plates, do we? We see a lot of plates. Let's admit it. There are a ton of plates around. But there are not a ton of this plate around. You think, what's the big deal? It's a simple little columbine, and it's got an initial on it. Well, that's even worse. We don't want someone else's monogram. Oh, but wait, what is that initial? Oh, it's DDE. Well, who has the initials DDE? Who would be somebody? Could it be Dwight David Eisenhower? Why, yes it is, because the back of the plate tells us this is by the Shenango Pottery, and this was made to be used on the very first Air Force One. And they were able to start doing jet engine aircraft, and he wanted a dinnerware service because suddenly the president was flying coast to coast, and they were going long, long distances. They had to be fed, so this was the service for Air Force One. They are extremely hard to find. An auction company that does specialty items relating to political folks sold one of these a couple of years ago for $2,520. And there has not been another one on the market since that I've been able to find. I was so excited to find this piece. And the gal said, oh, my dad was in the Air Force and you know, we have this plate that he says was from Eisenhower's plane and we think the story is true and as soon as I saw it I was like oh yeah baby you got it <laughs> and that was pretty exciting so this particular piece now I'm not gonna lie I debated whether to put this on eBay because really I might do best if I sent this to the house that already got 2500 for one but there's a trade-off with that I could send it to them, but they've already sold one to their highest and best bidder. I don't know who number two bidder was. I don't know if they were willing to pay $2,400 or $1,500 or they found one cents and they don't need one. So just because you see a huge high price on something, you really have to temper that with I'm not the first one selling it. I'm the second one selling it. So what will the second buyer who wants this pay? And we're going to find out. I am putting a very high starting price on this because out of deference to my client, I really have to get a good number on this for them. It's only right and fair. And because if someone really wants it, they're going to step up. I believe I'm starting it somewhere in the $1,700 to $1,900 range. And I am curious to see where it'll go. But I have a hunch that it may very well sell for that price. So... That was something really different, and I'm so excited to get to show that to you, and just so excited to show you all these things. I love taking the extra time every month to do a little extra research about some different things that are not just the usual little fun, cute things that maybe we put on a live sale or we throw up in our eBay store for someone to stumble across at some point. I really try to find some things that are going to broaden my horizons as well as all of you folks. So I hope you enjoyed this. I sure did. Thank you so much for joining me. And uh, again, if you're a level two member, I thank you so much for helping sponsor this. And I'm glad to give you first dibs as a result. And for everyone else, I hope that you enjoy seeing this video, having this information. And if the things are still available on eBay, you can go take a look and maybe they're for you too. So thank you all so much for joining me and we'll see you again soon. Bye-bye now. Thanks for joining me again in the fun and fascinating antique community here where online meets the real world. Please click the subscribe button below, click the bell to be notified when new videos upload, leave a comment below and hit thumbs up to like this video. Links to our online social media daily posts and our items for sale are in the description. This is George at the Antique Nomad. Bye for now!